All right. Well, good evening and welcome to our midweek Bible study on Thursday nights. We're going through the Bible, book by book and chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And tonight we are in Ecclesiastes. Now, last week we only got to verse 12 of chapter 5. We're going to pick it up in chapter 5 tonight. And Lord willing, uh, make it through to the end of chapter 6. We'll see how it goes. Uh, no promises, no hurry, by the way. We don't want to miss anything that the Lord has for us in His Word. So before we get started, I wanted to mention that we're in the process of launching a new website at jdfarag.org. And this is going to be the go-to place, especially for the prophecy update videos. And we actually are anticipating that at some point uh, in the not too distant future, hopefully not too soon, <laughs> but uh, we do anticipate that we will be uh, censored and have already had uh, it happen on a smaller scale. It's really, I believe, been by the grace of God that we're still on YouTube. Uh, given the uh, topics that we've tackled. And uh, so what we need you to do now, we've had a lot of people email us saying, hey, uh, sign me up. And what we actually need for you to do is go to the website. And at the bottom of the page will be a place where you can enter your email and then submit it. You won't get a confirmation email, but just enter your email and then you will be on the list. Um, we appreciate your patience with us. And more importantly, uh, I would just ask you to pray for us. Uh, I'm speaking to those of you in our online church. We have stayed open and there are some real challenges and uh, we're doing the best that we can to err on the side of an abundance of caution. And so we really appreciate your prayers for us here on the windward side of Oahu. We really covet your prayers specifically for uh, this church fellowship here locally and uh, really for protection over this God's flock, the flock of God and uh, this church. So we appreciate that and thank you for that. So again, we'll pick it up in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. And if you would please join with me, we'll begin with a word of prayer before we get into the Word. Lord, thank you so much. Lord, we love you so much, and we're so thankful to you, and we love your Word so much, and we're so hungry and thirsty for that which we only know only you can satisfy. So Lord, please will you, as only you can, feed us, nourish us, minister to us, speak into our lives. Lord, we desperately, in these times, as the world just gets crazier and crazier, Lord, we desperately need for you to help us. We really need your help to focus our attention so our minds don't wander, because a lot of us are just hit from every side and so many things coming at us and the busyness of our lives and the stress of everything that's happening. And Lord, this is a, a sanctuary for us. It's a, a solace. And uh, so, Lord, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do in our time together tonight in your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're looking forward to tonight here in the last part of chapter 5 and even through chapter 6, Solomon, who, as you know, I'm sure, is speaking from his own experience as the wealthiest man who ever lived. And he's concluding that riches, that wealth can never satisfy. And the reason that riches and wealth can never satisfy 
is because God never made us to be satisfied with anything, or I'll add even anyone but Him. Try as you may. And Solomon is trying, and he's going to do this for 12 chapters. By the way, we're halfway through. And it's been kind of grueling, but it's needed. It's much needed. It's a process. It's, it's going through, if I can say it like this, by proxy, learning from Solomon instead of repeating that which Solomon does. And I mean, there are, and you have to admit, those times where you think, well, I, I know that, you know, money can't buy happiness, as they say, but I'd like to try. <laughs> I mean, it couldn't hurt. Uh, you know, I, I know that riches don't satisfy, but you, you never know. I mean, I, can we just, no need. Solomon already tried. It doesn't work. In fact, not only will it not satisfy, it will actually leave you more dissatisfied than before. And that's what we're going to see tonight. Dissatisfaction, discontentment, and even despair. It's really going to be interesting. So let me preface it before we jump in with this reminder that Solomon is still on this insatiable quest to find meaning and purpose and satisfaction in life without God, in life under the sun, S-U-N, not S-O-N. And so, and we, we've been noticing this, this struggle back and forth. It's almost like against his will, he goes kicking, fighting, biting, scratching, and screaming back to God. Because unless he does that, there's no way to reconcile anything in this life, absent the true and living God. And such is the case with what we're going to see here tonight. So verse 13, there is a severe evil which I have seen under the sun, riches kept for their owner to his hurt. But those riches perish through misfortune. When he begets a son, there is nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, verse 15, naked shall he return to go as he came, and he shall take nothing from his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. And this also is a severe evil. <laughs> That's interesting choice of wording as it's translated. A, it's not just evil, it's a severe evil. This is unthinkable, unspeakable. He says, just exactly as he came, so shall he go. And what profit has he who has labored for the wind? All his days <laughs> he also eats in darkness and he has much sorrow and sickness and anger. Man, I can just feel the anger. In other words, here I've worked all my life. I've amassed all this wealth, and it's brought me nothing but misery, sorrow, pain. I think about Paul writing to Timothy. We're going to see when we get to chapter 6. You know we're in chapter 4. We're getting there. But it's perhaps amongst the most, if not the most, misquoted Scripture in all of the Bible. And you know it well. Paul writing says, for the love of money, love of money is the root of all evil. We know that part, but sometimes we don't finish the rest of it 
and the last part of it, because he goes on to say, why? It's the root of all evil. Here Solomon says, this is a severe evil. He's basically bearing witness to that which the Apostle Paul would write all these generations later. Why is it evil? Why is the love of money? Because see, when you love money, you'll never have money enough. It's never enough. And, and because it was never meant to satisfy, you obtain it, you amass it, you achieve it, you stockpile it, and then once you have it, you realize, what was that about? I'm, I'm more miserable now than I was before. So what am I going to do? Well, I'll get more. Maybe that'll do it. So you get more. And that just makes you more empty, more dissatisfied, which in turn, cyclically, it's a vicious cycle. It makes you want even more. And then you get even more. And then you're even more empty. So you get even more. No wonder he's angry. I'm angry just thinking about it. Paul goes on to say, the reason why the love of money is the root of all evil, or to quote Solomon, a severe evil, is because those who pursue it, seek after it, will pierce themselves through with many sorrows. That's why. That's what Solomon's saying. Here I... <laughs> I've pursued this, I've amassed this, and it has brought me nothing but trouble. We saw this last week in verse 12. He just got done talking about the riches of a man permits him no sleep because he's laying in bed. He can't sleep. Why? Because all he's thinking about is his riches. And here's the thing, the more you have, the more you worry about losing what you have and keeping what you have. When you don't have it, no problem. I got nothing to worry. I'm going to sleep fine. <laughs> and it's like the the and, and this is in the Proverbs. Wealth can take the very life of the one who possesses it. It's like you no longer possess it; it possesses you. And this speaks to that very simple truth that it's not what you have, it's what has you. There's nothing wrong with a Christian having nice things. God will entrust wealth and prosperity to His servants who are faithful, to whom much is given, much is required. There is a stewardship dynamic there present. But it's you have it, but it doesn't have you. It doesn't own you. It doesn't drive you. And Solomon is talking about, hey, uh, this is the master passion of my life. And what it has brought is nothing but sorrow, nothing but pain, nothing but misery. Remember the word misery comes from the word miser, misery, misery. I, I have to say, that over the years, I've met a lot of very miserable misers on the mainland many years ago when I was very young. And at the time working for Mercedes Benz, I had occasion to meet a lot of very wealthy people. And I thought to myself, man, they must be so happy. No. <laughs> they were the most miserable people I had ever met so unhappy, so stressed on their third marriage. Their kids, forget it. I mean, their lives are in ruins. Their lives are nothing but chaos. And all because, and I know we've talked about this, but I can't uh, help but mention it again. I think it's apropos. You've seen those television shows where they follow the lottery winners to see how, how, how's it going? Man, you've got a maid in the shade. You can live happily ever after. And they go on to talk about how their lives have been completely destroyed. 
by the wealth, by the riches. I mean, you, you would think that that would solve all of the problems. But here's the problem with thinking that money solves all of the problems. Uh, money is not a God. You cannot serve both God and money, Jesus said. It's either one or the other. It's interesting. Jesus did not say it would not be a good idea to. He did not say you shouldn't. No, He said you can't. It's an impossibility. It's not both. It's either or. You're either going to love the one and hate the other or vice versa. You cannot serve both God and money. Who's your master? Who's your master? And actually, that's what he talks about throughout the rest of Matthew chapter 6. Well, let's move on. Verse 18. Here's what I've seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life, which God gives him for it is his heritage. As for every man, verse 19, to whom God has given riches and wealth and given him power to eat of it. Uh, that's not a given. Just because you have it doesn't mean you're going to enjoy it. So if you are given it and you're able to enjoy it, to receive his heritage and to rejoice in his labor. Well, this is the gift of God. At least he's acknowledging God. Again, it's almost like unwillingly he has to bring God back in. Because that's the only way that this even comes close to making any sense. And then he says, last verse, verse 20, for he will not dwell unduly on the days of his life, because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart. Now, at first read, you might almost get the impression that, yeah, good, he came to his senses. You know, in the end, at the end of the day, the final analysis, Solomon is, you know, finally just kind of coming to his senses saying, hey, God gives it, just enjoy it. I wish that were it. <laughs> it's actually not. What do you mean? Well, you know what he's saying here? He's basically saying, you only go around once, so you might as well live it up. That's what he's saying. If you're only living for this life, then pff, might as well just live it up. I, I, I forget the saying, and maybe that's a good thing to forget secular sayings, <laughs> but doesn't it go something like this? Um, you might as well eat, drink, and be merry because, you know, tomorrow you die. Maybe that's not it. That's kind of dark, I know, but you get the point. In other words, you only go around once. You might as well just kind of live it up. Can all you get, get all you can. And that's what Solomon has been reduced here to. He slammed the door shut on God, and this is what he gets. Because again, he's, he's resolute. He has strengthened his resolve, if I can say it that way, to eliminate God from the equation of life. And as you can see, it's not working out too well. Now, chapter 6, he continues on concerning this, and he says again, verse 1, there is an evil, not severe evil this time, so there is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is common among men. In other words, I see it all the time. A man, verse 2, to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor, so that he lacks nothing for himself of all he desires, yet God does not give him power to eat of it, but a foreigner consumes it. This is vanity, and it is an evil affliction. What's Solomon concluding here? What Solomon's saying here? He's saying that it is evil to amass all of this wealth and not enjoy it. 
And it's almost like this. The people with the most enjoy it the least, and conversely, the people with the least enjoy it the most. And, and this has to do with contentment. And we're, again, we're going to talk about that more in a moment. Verse 3 is interesting. He says, if a man begets a hundred children. Stop right there. What? A hundred? Listen, I have three living children. Plenty. Plenty children. A hundred children. And by the way, a man. What about the mom? Oh my goodness, a hundred of those urchins, as they're called. I like that urchins, because it's kind of like it, you know, it's one of those words that sound like, you know, it's kind of irks me, those urchins, you know, it's a hundred children. Well, it's of course figurative, because in that culture, in that day, and it's really much the same today in the Middle East, you, your wealth, your stature, your prominence, your prosperity is not gauged by what you do for a living, but by how many children you have. You know, in the Middle East, you don't ask somebody, hey, what do you do for a living? That's code for, how much money do you have? <laughs> uh, you know, what do you do for a living? They don't ask you that. They ask you this, how many children do you have? That's the gauge. That's the litmus test. So Solomon is talking about a full life, and certainly a hundred children would do that and accomplish that. And so not only a full life with a hundred children, but a long life and lives many years, so that the days of his years are many, but, oh, you know it's coming, his soul is not satisfied with goodness, or it gets worse, indeed, he has no burial. I say that a stillborn child is better than he. And here's why. For it comes, speaking of the stillborn child, in vanity and departs in darkness, and its name is covered with darkness. Th this is very dark, right? <laughs> a lot of darkness here. Verse 5, though it has not seen the sun or known anything, this has more rest than that man, even if he lives a thousand years twice. That's 2,000 years, right? So he's contrasting this man that has a hundred children and a long life, 2,000 years, comparing it to the stillborn child that lives only minutes. But this man who lives a thousand years twice, but has not seen goodness, do not all go to one place. What is Solomon saying here? Well, he's basically saying that you can have all of this outward fullness, but yet have inward emptiness. I mean, you, you look at this guy, and outwardly, because man looks at the outward appearance, but God sees the heart. So man looks at the outward appearance, and he sees all of these children, all of this wealth. And here's this man living this long, prosperous life. And outwardly, you would think, wow, he must be so fulfilled. And on the inside, he is dying and wishes, in fact, that he could die like that stillborn child, because it would be better to be that stillborn child and not live that life and come to the end of that life and have it come to naught. You know, when you, as it's been said, climb the ladder of success in life, only to find out that when you get to the top, the ladder was up against the wrong wall. And it's just this. And sometimes it, it takes that to realize that. And I'll explain what I mean by that. You know, as a pastor over the years, I've had occasion to be at the bedside of many 
a person who was taking their last breath in this life and their first breath in eternity. And I tell you, it's a sobering, introspective time, obviously, I think, for what would be deemed obvious reasons. And as I've gotten to know people, as is my privilege to be able to get to know people over the years, and then here they're coming to the end of their life, and there's always that regret, that, that sorrow, that man, if I, if I had to do it all over again, I would have done it differently. And I have yet to ever talk with anyone at the end of their life who has ever said to me, I wish I would have spent more time working. I wish I would have spent more time working, laboring, making more money. It's the opposite. And I think this speaks to what we refer to as workaholism. I'm going to, why did I go there? Because I'm really convicted now. <laughs> but maybe we need to talk about this just for a moment. It's that, that painful toil and labor. My wife uh, today said, hey, I need to get you out of, you know, cause I'm seven days a week, you know, just all hours of the day and sometimes into the night. And um, it's a joy. I mean, I'm not complaining. I dare not complain because later on uh, we're going to see what happens to people who complain. But um, she just said, hey, why don't we just take the day tomorrow and maybe get out and I need to get you out of here. You know, I, th <laughs> I said, wow, do I look that bad and that mad? You know, I, I picture that, you know, uh, that professor that's, you know, the hair's going all over the place. And well, of course, that's not a problem for me, but, you know, just kind of, <laughs> you know, kind of losing his, he's like, I need to, you need to get out. Because all she said, all you do is you go from your office here in the home to the church and back. I said, no, that's not true. I try to go out to get spicy ahi pokey every once in a while, but but said, no, let's, let's, let's go out. So we're, we're actually planning, uh, we haven't done this in, what year is this? <laughs> well, basically ever since this whole thing started back in uh, March. And um, it's good. You know, it's a sharpening the saw. You've heard that illustration, that if the saw is dull, it takes so much more work to cut down the tree. But if you take that saw and you sharpen it, then you go to cut that tree, it is so much sharper and it's so much quicker and takes so much less work to do. So I'm, by the way, none of you need to hear this. This is for me tonight. So I'm, the preacher is being preached to right now. But um, it is, uh, uh, it is a thing, if I can say it like that, where there is this working, this toiling, this laboring. And you get to the end of your life and you look back on it and it can just be devastating when you realize, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm empty. It, it has not satisfied me. And Solomon again is trying everything. He's trying to do everything he can to be satisfied under the sun, absent God. Well, lest I get even more convicted, let's move on to verse 7, because I want you to be convicted now. So <laughs> he goes on to write, all the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the soul is not satisfied. You know, I was thinking about this. You know, we, we can, we, we try to feed the flesh and we end up starving the spirit. You know, uh, when I was a young believer, I could never quite understand what it meant to uh, walk in the spirit so you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. What, what does that look like? What, what, what does that mean? What, what's the application? Okay, so walk in the Spirit. What, what does that mean? And what the Lord ministered to me was this, that 
It's being so busy in the spirit that you have no time for the flesh. You're, you're feeding the spirit and you're starving the flesh. But see, here's the problem. We feed the flesh and then we end up starving the spirit. The f- spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And this is what Solomon is talking about here. You know, you can have this leanness of soul in your soul. Spiritually, you can be famished, yet physically full. Here you eat, you work to eat, you labor so that you can put food on the table. And all of that labor can leave you unsatisfied in your soul at the soul level. You remember that account in Numbers 11, where the Israelites, well, it's actually the mixed multitudes, which is interesting in and of itself. The mixed multitudes being those Egyptians who left Egypt with the Israelites. That was a problem because they had undue influence on the Israelites. So here they are in the desert. And how is God providing for them. Oh, he's uh, bringing bread, manna from heaven. And it's there every day, as much as they need. And for those who, you know, the misers, the miserable misers that tried to gather more, you know, just stockpile more, turns into maggots the next day. Why? Because God wants you to trust him tomorrow for tomorrow, not today. He will give you today's manna, today. You know the prayer that the Lord taught the disciples to pray when they asked Him, Lord, teach us to pray. We've seen how powerful prayer is in your life. We want some of that. (laughs) So will you teach us to do that? So He says, you know, what we affectionately refer to as a Lord's prayer is really our prayer. But there's that, that one part where He says, give us this day our daily bread. See, that that goes against my flesh, because my flesh wants certainty. It's more like this, give me this day my monthly bread, so I know it's there. So I just, just, you know, just, I know it's there, and okay. Oh, oh, well, wait a minute, what if I want you to, by faith, trust me tomorrow for tomorrow? Not trust in that. What you've kept aside. So now you're putting your trust in that. So you're provided for. So I'm going to make a turn to maggots. So you learn to trust me. So here's the Israelites, and they're getting sick of manna, because the mixed multitude started planting seeds in their ears like, man, th- this is your God? That all He gives you is manna? I mean, it's just manna. Manna burgers, manna cotti, manna, manna this, manna that. We want meat to eat. We want flesh, not this manna. And so the Israelites started crying out. And it's kind of interesting because it's like selective memory. Oh, those were the days when we were in Egypt. We ate the fish and the leeks and the delicacies. And oh, those were, oh, to be back in Egypt. Like, you were slaves, man. What are you talking about? What, what, what buffet were you at? We were eating bricks, if you, if you recall. And so they're, they're complaining and murmuring against the Lord. And their voice reaches the ears of Moses and God. But let's talk about Moses first. I, I would really encourage you, Numbers chapter 11. Man, that would make a great movie. I mean, it it is so, it is. uh, (laughs) So here's Moses. He is so angry, so discouraged, so frustrated. This was what he says to God. What did I do to deserve this? 
These are your people. There's another account where God and Moses are going back and forth. They're not my people. They're your people. No, there's not. It's kind of like the, the mother and the father going, hey, that's your son. Uh, no, it's your son. That's from your side of the family. But anyway, and, and they're going back and forth about who, you know, and, and here's Moses saying, what did I do to this? Are you mad at me? I did. These are not my people. I did not give birth to these people. These are your people. Why are you punishing me? What did I do? Why are you angry with me? They're killing me. Now, it's in uh, the, the text. And I encourage you to read it. Here's an interesting detail. Moses is literally, not hyperbole, he is literally at the end of himself, and he asks God to kill him. That's how bad it is. Oh, no, for real. It's not, again, hyperbole. He's, he's like, will you please just put me out of my, I can't take this anymore. These people are killing me. Like you have to understand, in all fairness to Moses, he has led them out of Egypt. They've seen the Red Sea part. They walked on dry land, and then they witnessed the Egyptians being drowned in the waters when they were pursuing the Israelites. They've witnessed a, a rock bringing forth water. They've witnessed miracle after miracle after miracle. They have never been in want. They've never died of thirst. They've never died of hunger. And repeatedly they're complaining, were there not enough graves in Egypt? God had to lead us out here to kill us. So God says, Moses, okay, it's, it's going to be okay. Just take a deep breath. I, I probably need to take a deep breath here too. <laughs> All right, here's what we're, <laughs> we're going to do. Okay, I'm going to anoint uh, others to kind of take, because clearly the burden is too great for Moses, and it's crushing him, and it's killing him. So God says, okay, we're going to take care of it. I, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to give them meat to eat, because they're, they're not satisfied with the manna. They're complaining about the manna. So I'll give them meat to eat. If that's what they want, fine. I'll give them flesh which is what meat is, flesh. By the way, you know that can of chili con carne? You know what carne means, right? Carnal, fleshly. You're eating chili with flesh. So bon appetit. <laughs> That's what it means. The word carnal, fleshly, it's carnality. So he says, they're, they're in their carnality wanting to eat flesh. Fine, I'll give them flesh. I'll give them meat. So here's Moses. It kind of reminds me of the disciples. He says to God, um, okay, wait a minute. God, how are you going to, how are you going to do that? All the fish that we're able to, you know, catch and all of the, there's no way you're going to get them enough meat to eat. And God says, oh, don't worry about it. I, got, I have ways. Watch me now. Watch what I'm going to do. He says, I'm not only going to give them meat to eat for a day or a week, I'm going to give them eat meat to eat for an entire month. In fact, <laughs> you want meat, do you? I'm going to give you all the meat you could possibly eat, and it's going to be in your teeth, and you're going to have your fill of it. And it's, I'm sorry, but it's in the text. Read it for yourself. I'm not, you know, um, I'm not, uh, what's that word, you know, what? Embellishing. embellishing. Thank you so much. Now, as I can always count on you, embellishing. He says, I'm going to make, I'm going to, you're going to be so full of this flesh, it's going to come out of your nostrils. <laughs> that is disgusting. Well, that's the point. You want meat? Apparently you're not satisfied with the manna. I'll give you meat to eat. I'll give you so much meat. So you know how it goes, right? You know what happens. Not, not based on a true story. This is a true story. This literally happened. 
all of these quail. And God has the quail within reach of the Israelites and the mixed multitudes. And they're going, yeah. And it says there was so much quail that they would not gather less than 10 homers. It's the first mention of baseball in the Bible, some believe. <laughs> That's the measurement. I'm sorry. In other words, they had plenty. And sure enough, they ate. Oh, wow. And then the next day, oh, wow. And then the next day, oh, wow. And then on and on and on. And finally, it's coming out of their nostrils. And the very flesh that they lusted after killed them. It ended in their own death. Now, you would think that would be bad enough, and it is. But when you get to Psalm 106, verse 15, the psalmist is recounting all of this, and he references this account in Numbers 11, and he actually adds uh, more to it, and fills in a couple of the blanks, because it says that God sent them meat to eat, but sent leanness into their soul. In other words, you want meat to eat? The, the, the bread of life, the bread of heaven, which by the way, manna was a type, a picture of Jesus. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And apparently that's not good enough. You're not satisfied. You lust after more. So I'll give it to you. I mean, you know, one of the things, you know, the Spirit of God does not strive with man forever. God's never going to force us into obedience. He's not going to force us to obey Him. I mean, at some point, it's like in Romans 1, it's a chilling chapter. It's a very apropos chapter for where we're at in the world today. But God just says, you know, He's going to give them over. It's not, it's not that, you know, they don't stand a chance. I mean, if you misunderstand that, you would think God is being unjust and unfair. What he's saying is, you know, you're lusting after, you know, someone of the same sex as you, woman for woman, and man for man, you're burning for each other, lusting for each other. At some point, God just says, okay, have it your way. You know, I mean, it's not like he's not putting up the stops, the warnings, but he just gives them over and says, okay, I've given you your own free will, your own choice, your own sovereignty over your own self. So if that's your decision, your heart is hardened, and your neck is stiffened, then okay. And he gives them over to it. And when that happens, you can be so full of the flesh, the lusts of the flesh, but proportionate to how you fill yourself with that, you will be lean, starving in your soul. Uh, one last thing, and we'll move on. We've got to get through chapter 6, right? We'll have you out of here by midnight. You brought your pajamas and toothbrushes, right? So, but here, here's a great illustration I heard that has stuck with me over the years. You have the lamb over here, that's the spirit, and you have the lion over here, that's the flesh. And that flesh rears its ugly head. What happens if you starve that lion and you feed that lamb. That, that lion will become so weak, it can't even get up. And now you're feeding and strengthening that lamb. That lamb's going to, you know, walk over there. And the lion can't do anything because the lion's been starved. And that lamb, the lamb of the spirit will prevail over the lion of the flesh. When you feed the spirit, 
you won't fulfill, fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 8, for what more has the wise man than the fool? What does the poor man have? Who knows how to walk before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of desire. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. This is an important principle, a truth. And it has to do with never being satisfied with what God's given you and what you have, because you're always thinking about what you don't have. Let me say the same thing in a different way. This is what Solomon is saying here. He's talking about this, this wandering desire. I mean, look what you have. Yeah, but I don't have that. Oh my goodness. So here you're desiring this when you have this. Again, contentment. Paul says that godliness with contentment is great gain. Great gain. It's all about contentment, being content with such things as you have not desiring more, because that then gets into covetousness and greed. And it has at its core the lusts of the flesh driving it. Verse 10, whatever one is, he has already been named, for it is known that he is man, and he cannot contend with him who is mightier than he. Here's another very profound truth, life-changing truth. And it has to do with arguing with God about His ways and His whys. Let me expound on that for just a moment. So His ways are higher than our ways. We cannot know His ways. Who can know the mind of the Lord? Who can know the ways of the Lord? Who can know the whys of the Lord? What good does it do to contend with God? God, why? Why did you allow this to happen? God, I, I don't understand. This makes no sense. Why, why, God, why? And here's the answer. It's not that I don't want to tell you. It's that I can't tell you. And the reason I can't tell you is because you could not fathom it. Because you're finite and I'm infinite. And there's no way the finite can comprehend the infinite, even if I tried. You know what would happen? Well, it's like every parent who's answering the the child's why questions. Why is the sky blue? Oh, because that's God's favorite color. Why is that God's favorite color? Because God likes blue. Why does God like blue? Why, 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 why? Listen, I don't know why, but there is coming a time when you're going to understand why. Yeah, but God, that was really painful. I don't know why you would have allowed it. Oh, you have no idea. If you only knew, I was protecting you from something infinitely more painful. Yeah, but God, that that really hurt. Oh, that's a hangnail compared to what I protected you from. But you can't understand that. In my sovereignty, I see the end from the beginning. And I'm going to allow things to happen because I know what's ahead. I know what's around the corner. Yeah, but God, When our daughter died, that was so painful. We really didn't think we were going to make it through it. Yeah, but look what I did. Look what I did. Oh, Lord. Yeah, but God, I worked so hard. I was so loyal in that company. And they just terminated me. The why? Oh, but look what I did. 
I, I opened up this door. And isn't it so much better than that one? Had it not been for that, you would not have had this. That's why sometimes God just does what He does. And understand, and this goes back to this question concerning prayer, unanswered prayer, more importantly, unanswered prayer. Why is it that you pray and pray and pray and pray and pray, and God doesn't answer the prayer? What's up with that? Well, sometimes God will say no. Sometimes God will say slow. Sometimes God will say grow. And there's sometimes where God will say go. See, if I'm wrong, God will say grow. If the request is wrong, God will say no. If the timing's wrong, God will say slow. But when the timing's right, and I'm right, and the request is right, God says, here you go. God's delays are not God's denials. And here's the other thing, and this has helped me so much. I hope it'll be a help and an encouragement to you concerning unanswered prayer. God will always answer your prayers exactly the same way you would answer your own prayers if you knew what He knew. You know, sometimes, and I, this is a very uh, good thing to do. I've done it for many, many years, over 20 years. I keep a prayer list, a prayer journal. And sometimes it's so good to go back over that prayer list and look at some of those prayers you prayed. <laughs> I mean, brace yourself, because sometimes you look at that prayer and you go, oh, God, Lord, I'm so sorry. I, I prayed that. No wonder you didn't answer that. It's kind of like God's in heaven going, you're praying that. That's all? I, look what I did. I, I, I would go back. I do it in both Microsoft Word, that's my prayer journal, my prayer list, Microsoft Excel, and I, go, I would go back and edit, delete. I did a lot of deleting because the prayers change things, prayer changes things, but sometimes prayer changes the prayer. And I would go back and change that prayer, edit that prayer. But when I look back in retrospect, and you've heard it said that, yes, we thank God for the prayers He has answered, but how many times have you praised God and thank God for the prayers He did not answer. Oh my goodness, if God would have answered that prayer that I prayed that way, it would have been catastrophic. And God knows it. It's kind of like you pray, oh God, and God's going, no, you don't want that. No, 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 no. no, no. That would be very bad, very bad, very, very bad. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. If it's good, God's going to give it to you. And, and His timing is going to be perfect too. God's not going to answer a prayer prematurely. And truth be known, you don't want Him to. There's His timing. It's, it's been said, God is never late, but He's never early either. God is always going to answer your prayer the exact same way that you would answer your own prayer if you were omniscient like Him, all-knowing like Him. The problem is you're not. I, mean, I know that might be a shocker, but you don't know. He knows all. He knows the end from the beginning. And if He were to answer that prayer that way, and you knew what was coming, if He did that, you would say, no God, scratch that. I take that back. Don't answer that prayer. Don't worry, I wasn't going to. Oh. There's a lot of why questions that will never be answered this side of eternity. And I think the sooner we as God's people are okay with that, the better. And the longer we're not okay with that, the more miserable we are. Unnecessarily, I might add. 
Don't contend with God. That's where trust comes in and faith, right? See, in our flesh, we want to walk by sight. I want to see it. Seeing is believing. It's not, it's the opposite. Believing is seeing. When you believe, then you'll see. The blind will see. Verse 11. All right, we're going to do it. We did it. Don't look at your clocks. Since there are many things that increase vanity, how is man the better? For, verse 12, who knows what is good for man in life? All the days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow. Who can tell a man what will happen after him under the sun? That's exactly the point. You don't know what happens. You don't know what's around that corner. God does. Here you're living your life thinking, hey, and we're going to see this again. By the way, oh, I can't wait. Next week, Lord willing, chapter 7, one of my favorite chapters in the book of Ecclesiastes. I know that I say that about every chapter, but chapter 7, particularly verse 14. So I'm going to give you homework. Ecclesiastes 7.14 a profound verse that really answers some big unanswered questions about God knowing the future and us not, and us having to look to Him, trust in Him for what's around the corner. We have to. We have to look to Him. Because see, if, if we're walking by sight and we know, then what's the point? We're not going to acknowledge Him. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, acknowledge the Lord. Don't trust in, don't lean, lean not unto your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Acknowledge the Lord in all your ways, and He will make your path straight. He will straighten it out. See, <laughs> because it's a mess. But when is it that we acknowledge the Lord in all of our ways and trust in the Lord with all of our heart? Is it not when we don't understand? Because if we did understand, we're not going to acknowledge Him. And there's no need to trust in Him because we got it. We got, I, I can take it from here. Okay, fine. I'll be here when you're done. It's, oh, it's going to be awful. You're going to go out and make it even worse. But I'll be here. You come to me, acknowledge me, trust in me. I'll straighten it out. But we think that somehow we're the, what is the captain of our own destiny? What's that song, famous song, it's going to date me, but whatever. I did it my way. You did? Ooh, wow. No, <laughs> uh, I want God to do it His way. I want God to do it His way. Why don't you stand next week, beginning in chapter 7, Solomon is going to turn a pretty sharp corner, actually. And he's now going to leave this notion of riches not satisfying. And he's, he's tried everything. He's tried philosophy and wealth and riches and possession and wine and women and all of these things. And he comes up empty at the end. And so now in chapter 7, he's going to go on to his next pursuit. Still not there. I have to wait till chapter 12 for that. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, God, thank you so much. So much here tonight for us to take home with us and for the Holy Spirit to begin that process of applying it to our lives, blessing it to our hearts so it's real. There's so many truths here that I pray, Lord, that, and I, I speak for myself as well, that we don't just leave this here and not do anything about it, make changes, adjustments. Maybe it's this attitude of having no gratitude towards you for everything you've done a disenchantment, a dissatisfaction, a discontentment. Oh, so dangerous, so dangerous. 
Lord, I pray that as we all go our separate ways tonight, that there will just be this sense, this much needed reminder that only you satisfy. Only you can satiate the deep need of our soul. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 